This is The Catholic Current with Father Robert Mateig. Hey, you know what would be a great idea? Let's denature the church. What's the selling point for that? What Archbishop Vigano has alleged is that there are some enemies within the church who essentially want to turn the church into a kind of ecumenical, nondescript, vague religion of the new world order, religion of the one world government. So kind of an NGO or the chaplaincy to the UN? Exactly. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus. You're really host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, they might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, you might hear uh, very often that that only women are allowed to talk about abortion. Now, this is a throwback phrase back to when we acknowledged that women were women and people who are not women are not women. And that kind of went away for a while until the Texas uh, heartbeat law put a little teeth into restricting abortion. Then all of a sudden, having a uterus actually mattered. And someone famous in Hollywood has posted the the theme, uh, no uterus, no opinion, suggesting that men don't have anything to say about abortion because they're not affected by abortion. Now, logically, her statement isn't true. Factually, it's not true either. To help us talk about that, we have our guest today is the chief operating officer of Support After Abortion, and he talks about getting healing for men who've been traumatized by abortion uh, themselves. Nathan Messerian, welcome to The Catholic Current. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Father. Nathan, I would imagine there are a lot of people who would be indignant and say, you know, men just walk away from the children that, that they beget, that, that they sire. That's part of the appeal of abortion. Uh, we we're told that if men could have abortions, abortion would be a sacrament. I'm sure you heard all those lines. But the men you work with tell a different story. What is that? Well, I appreciate that question. So I'm thinking about a, I'm thinking about a man who, um, at, at the age of 23, uh, did pay uh, um, thinking he was helping his girlfriend to get an abortion. Um, he, he thought that was the way to, quote, handle the issue. wasn't thinking of it as a child. He certainly uh, thought of it as a clump of cells. And not until 15 years later does he have a, a time to meet Jesus and even on a Catholic pilgrimage um, recounted his sin and now looks back with great, great shame and guilt for having made that decision. And he's on a path now of of healing. So that is our predominant conversation here in society that um, men are the instigators. Our society might say things like men are perpetrators. They caused this unplanned pregnancy. They paid for the abortion. And while that's true, I'll just say one thing that's unique is support after abortion commissioned a research study done just this year, 2021, and using um, very careful demographics. We hired an a independent research firm. They interviewed well over 100 men who personally have experienced abortion. You'll be surprised to learn that 44% of those men didn't even know an abortion was going to happen, that the woman made the choice. He had no, no voice in the matter. And that's why what we're hoping to do with this conversation is men are hurting, not just because they caused it or paid for it, there's a large share of men who will say are hurting because they didn't have a voice. They didn't know they could stand up for their child. And that decision was made without them. Just an ex- it's a conversation you don't typically hear. No, that that, that, is, that is certainly true. Um, you know, there's been some uh, studies about women in, in grief, and there's books with titles like mm-hmm. No One Tell Me I Could Cry or The Forbidden yes. Grief. Even mm-hmm. more so, I think, grief among uh, men, that it's not simply forbidden, it, it's not even acknowledged, it's not even conceptualized so as being possible. Uh, mm. so, but what, what is it like for, for a, a man who either paid for an abortion mm-hmm. and then had regrets, mm-hmm. or realized after yeah. the fact that the woman he impregnated didn't even tell him she was pregnant, and then years later 
he receives this, yes. this revelation. What, what happens in, in those mm-hmm. men next? So I want to set some context as I answer your question. Okay. And let's just think about the culture we live in. I want to be clear, I'm not here blaming our culture. Mm-hmm. But our society limits which group of men are approved or acceptable to hurt. And so with great respect, I also agree with what I'm going to say next, which is our veterans, people who have served as either first responders in the military, it's quite acceptable in our society to acknowledge you might have PTSD and have seen and experienced some horrific things. Mm -hmm. What we're learning from men who, who either paid for the abortion, who were being supportive, quote unquote, sitting in the abortion clinic waiting for the surgical abortion to take place or or um, driving their girlfriend or, or wife home is they are dealing with the trauma of having aborted a child and that weight of losing a life is is haunting but if you look at just general media or general society you, you don't hear dinner conversation at a restaurant uh, in a church pew um, saying that i had an abortion um, it's just unheard of. And so for men who might be thinking, well, am I the only one that feels that way? Culture would say you are. So therefore, stuff it down. Right. And so they hide that, sometimes even greatly repress it. And one thing that we found at Sport After Abortion is we've been working closely with some mental health, mental health counselors who specialize in caring for men. None of their patients over 25 years ever started the conversation with, I've had an abortion. What they will start a conversation with are, I'm an alcoholic, I'm addicted to uh, sex, I work too much, I can't relate to my kids, I'm angry all the time. And they have a body of work after 25 years that 40% actually have an unhealed abortion in their past. Mm. And so what we're learning is that we think we need to meet people where they're at. Let's help address the trauma or presenting behaviors that are at the forefront and then work backwards, heal what we can and work backwards towards that deeper trauma or unhealed pieces. And we think that's how we'll help men move towards healing, but not by coming at it straight on. Because our culture would say that's not a men's issue with, per your opening remarks. Friends, I'm speaking today with Nathan Masirian. He's uh, Chief Operating Officer of Support After Abortion that works for bringing healing to, to men who've been traumatized by abortion. Uh, Nathan, you know, I, I know that um, men's grief isn't something that you it's really allowed to, to talk about, you know, the, the idea of you know, yes. big boys don't cry, et, et cetera. And again, some people have mm-hmm. permission to grieve, you know, first responders, yeah. Uh, soldiers and and they, they they've earned that acknowledgement and I'm not diminishing that in, in at not one spec. Yeah. Uh, but it seems that we don't have we don't even have a vocabulary. Again, someone might say, mm. you know, I'm I'm depressed or I fell into the bottle uh, or I, I I took up crack whatever it is, and there's a vocabulary for talking about that. And you're not necessarily mm. shamed for saying you need a 12 step program. But to say Correct. that I'm grieving over abortion, um, mm-hmm. men have to be pushed aside in order for the social narrative to continue. Is that correct? That's right. That's true. There's an organization um, called Life Perspectives. They're based in California. They're a body uh, that produces research from around the country. They did an interesting study this year. The focus was on how do men handle grief as it relates to a miscarriage experience. And the researchers found that men will use metaphors because you're exactly right, Father. There's not a language to describe grief for men because it's not, it's not part of the narrative. And so this is available, again, at that life perspective. Um, but men use metaphors to describe, describe their loss with, with miscarriage. We've also interviewed men who've had abortion. And I want to reveal to you the metaphor that they're using. And you might be surprised to hear it. The metaphor... Um, And the reality is actually the same. They describe, I've lost the opportunity to be a father. And to say it it more succinctly, lost fatherhood. And we believe, and what's new with sport after abortion is we believe that that's the new conversation to start talking about. It completely respects the woman who physically has experienced the abortion. And we are certainly not taking anything away from the 
the hurt and pain, um, grief, sadness that comes with it. But for men, we can have a complementary conversation in parallel that speaks to the missed opportunity. They had to be a father. And I, I spoke with a man who's, who experienced abortion, and he says that each day that he drives home from work, he can't help but see his neighbor playing catch with his son. Hmm. And he says to himself, that could have been me. Um, oh. and this idea, we believe, is really where we want to take the conversation moving forward and give a safe place for men to say, I too miss being a dad. What could it have been like? How can I reclaim it? And so I want to give a message of hope. Other men that I've spoken to who, who've experienced abortion and have this, have this great loss of being a fatherhood, they have turned towards serving others as a way to help fill that void. And so they may be serving with Knights of Columbus. They may be serving in their, their local parishes or with schools. But they are looking, they're seeking ways, consciously or unconsciously, to try to fill that lost fatherhood void. So we think there's a real Nathan, opportunity Nathan, we're here. coming up on, on, a, on a hard break, so we're, we're going to take up the thread of the conversation in the next segment. Friends, we come back, we're going to continue our conversation on finding healing for men who've been traumatized by, by abortion. There's a conference coming up soon that we're going to be talking about. Our rallying cry here is Christus Mundo Mundus Christo, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. We do it for the greater glory of God, the love of our neighbor, and the salvation of our own soul. Everything you need to take this conversation to your family and friends we give to you. Together, let's take it around the world. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Are you ready to take on the world of flesh and the devil with just the facts? This is Jesse Romero, host of Jesus 911, heard weekdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. I'm joined each day by a variety of co-hosts like Ruben Nava, Paul Clay, Dan Schneider, and my amazing wife, Anita Romero. We tackle Catholic devotions, spiritual warfare, family life, saving America, and everything in between. Join us each weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific for Jesus 911. God bless you. Keep the faith. You're listening to The Catholic Current with Father Robert Mateig from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Stay connected with the show, our guests, and topics by following the show on Twitter and Gab. Just search for The Catholic Current. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for The Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. My guest today is Nathan Messiri, and he's Chief Operating Officer of Support After Abortion, working to bring healing to men who've been traumatized by abortion. Nathan, in the last segment, you said that one of the ways that men can come to terms with their grief and find healing when they recognize that they've, as they said, lost fatherhood or lost the opportunity to be a father, is to get involved in service. Towards that end, uh, post-abortive men, if you could use that phrase, you're working with them to set up a conference that's coming up very soon. Tell us about the conference, please. Oh, thank you. So there's a website called menhealingfromtrauma.com, menhealingfromtrauma.com. It is a it is the very first conference that speaks to men who've experienced abortion. But because, as we mentioned in the previous segment, men don't just come forward and want to talk about abortion. And so the reason we use this, this conference title, Unraveling the Roots of Men's Trauma, is we want to find a, the broadest starting point to have a conversation with a man who's presenting issues, again, like could be alcoholism, workaholism, sexual behavior that's, that's outside the bounds of marriage, for example. And we're going to have a series of speakers. Uh, there's a combination of both live and pre-recorded, including two NFL players. Uh, one's a free agent, current free agent, and one is a former NFL player. They're going to share real man-to-man -man stories of what it's like to face trauma, what it's like to overcome it. We also have a number of presenters who are going to share their abortion story firsthand and this conference is not just for men. Yes, that's who we want to help. Our bigger objective, for after abortion, wants to be what we call a catalyst for change. 
So we actually want this conference to be a light bulb moment for people who are leading healing programs, pregnancy centers, dioceses, all around the world to say, maybe we're missing out on reaching men who are also hurting in our own parish, in our own community. And so we hope leaders will come to this conference and see and hear firsthand, what does a conversation even look like with a man who's had an abortion? What does it look like when someone has not been healed and the pain and anguish they're still in? And then what's it look like further down the road? We're also going to have several authors who will be sharing brand new curriculum designed to help people walk through a program for healing, both one-on-one and in a group setting. We're also going to be having a special segment by our founder of Support After Abortion, in which she'll be revealing the consumer research that many leaders would like to better understand what is going through the heart and mind of a man who's experienced abortion. So we'll be sharing all that research. The conference is completely free. And if I could just add one more piece, which I know is going to sound very promotional in nature, but if you sign up for the conference, again, menhealingfromtrauma.com, you will have unlimited access to all the recordings after the conference. The reason that's so important is we just want to be a tool, a catalyst to further this conversation without any barriers to get access to this one-of-a-kind information. Well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that because I, speaking from a spiritual point of view as a priest, one of the ways that the enemy keeps someone from healing is through, through isolation, and isolation leads mm. to despair. You know, your pain isn't real, mm. and even if it were right. real, you're the only one who has it, and admitting that pain is shameful. So numb the pain with something sinful. And, you know, you know yes, sometimes mm. sin is, is rooted in malice, but oftentimes it's just a, a desperate way of trying to numb pain and to numb grief that, that a, mm. a man doesn't know uh, how, how to deal with. What, what are you hoping to, to have as a result of this conference? What would, you, what would be the hallmarks of the conference wow. having been a success? Thank you. So uh, let's, let's speak spiritually, because this mm. is a conversation about good and evil in many ways, the, the opportunity to go against the culture. What's going to be unique in this conference is we have, at the midpoint, we have um, a priest who's also on the board of directors of Support for Abortion. He's going to be providing a talk which we call the invitation to healing. So if there are men who are listening um, uh, to our live conference, we want them to be able to start right away, say, yes, I'm ready to make a change. Of course, we know that doesn't make you perfect. We know that it doesn't happen overnight. But we're going to create a spiritual place where that change can start. We also have our, our, our bishops. The Diocese of our Bishop of, of Venice, Florida, is going to be doing a very unique talk to give hope to men, just as King David was healed from uh, the sin that he committed. He wants to give a a challenge of encouragement. So we want to provide spiritual hope. Second thing is for leaders to walk through the conference and say, wow, I didn't know all this curriculum is available to be able to provide a healing program for men. And typically what we find is that women are the ones that are leading and providing healing programs. Our goal would, would be to see new healing programs, whatever they may be, spring up from in around the world. We also have a partnership with That Man Is You, which is a small group ministry, uh, Catholic-based, as you may know, and we're encouraging their small group leaders to attend the conference so that they could be more effective in providing healing in their weekly one-on-one. So that's our biggest outcome, is seeing opportunity for men to get healed. More importantly, bigger for us, is encouraging healing programs to begin all around the world. Again, our goal is just to be a catalyst for change and we have a unique platform to bring this to life through this conference. Friends, I'm speaking today with Nathan Messirian. He's Chief Operating Officer of Support After Abortion, working to bring healing to men who've been traumatized by abortion. So this conference, as you've described, it reminds me of the observation that if you want to build a fire, you have to start by gathering kindling. So yes, you'll be working for the healing Mm -hmm. of men, but you're also going to be working towards uh, getting people to be leaders themselves, to, to be leavened in, in the bread in their own local communities. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Um, we've been talking, I've had the chance to speak to about 60 pregnancy centers in just the last two months. Many ask the question, it's important to save the baby and to help the mom. Why should we even care about the dad? And so I'd like to just address that from a leadership sure. perspective. 
what, what we're finding is um, men who are unhealed from abortion continue that behavior, which means they are bringing other women to, the, to an abortion decision. We want to be able to help stop abortion by healing the man so he's not being the perpetrator. He's not unwitting, unwittingly, uh, wittingly uh, contributing to, to an unplanned pregnancy. That's, what, that's our message to pregnancy centers. There's a real opportunity to influence the other side of the equation. Right. And we also just want to equip you. Here's how to do it. And so what I want to add, Father, is following the conference, we're offering a four-week free webinar just for leaders. We're going to actually role play and demonstrate how to run a healing program for men. And you can oh, sign up so at the conference for that free webinar as well. Yeah, I, I think you're onto something very important because, you know, yes, you know, people talk about legislative solutions or regulative uh, solutions or even economic solutions uh, for abortion, but there has to be a sense of conversion. You know, since the, the 1950s and 1960s, right. we've been, you know, thanks to the pill and, and abortion, uh, there's been a mm -hmm. separation uh, notionally, not factually, but notionally uh, from, you know, mm -hmm. hey, 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 sex has nothing to do with fertility. And fertility has nothing to do with becoming a mother or becoming a father. And then one step further, you know, you, that culture tells us that we are absolutely entitled to have sex without consequence, as if there could be such a thing. Mm. And, and we know mm. uh, that, that there, there, there really isn't. So I like the idea of part of the healing process is a conversion. It, it's a restoration mm -hmm. uh, conceptually that, you know, that there is a natural link between sexuality and fertility and parenthood, and those are best mm -hmm. located in, in the context of, uh, of marriage. Can, can you talk a little bit about the conversion that's necessary to move us away from a culture of abortion to a culture yes. of life? That's, that's, that's such a big topic. I, uh, I'll just smile humbly and do my very best to answer such a vital question. Sure. Um, one of the ways that we're wanting to be the hands and feet of Christ is that we've partnered with um, Word Among You, and they've uh, co-written a book with us, booklet called Keys to Hope and Healing. And there's actually two versions. There's a version for the person who has no no religious context. But to you and I who, who know the Lord and understand the scriptures, it is rooted in a conversion process, acknowledging your, your decision, for example, seeking forgiveness, um, asking for... Um, asking for grace to change. Some of these principles might very sound similar to uh, the AA process, but it's a six-step process to walk through. Then there's also um, a, a very direct um, version of that that is imbued with biblical references so that you can see where that principle comes from. So we believe that's important towards conversion. We also have uh, much of our work is done in a religious context. So typically diet in a diocesan way, in pregnancy centers, you have a religious bent. Uh, they they often are looking for material that speaks to speaks to Christ. But we need to start with there's hope for the pain that you have. You are not hopeless. And so, trying to answer your question is uh, we believe conversion is the key uh, towards healing. We can meet them um, directly if they're ready, but we also need to we find pave the way because society has said your pain is too great or your pain doesn't exist or your feelings are just confused. And we're saying those feelings are real. Here's a path to healing and Jesus Christ is, is the step in that process. I, I have to believe for, for people who, who think that, that the mercy of God is simply too good to be true, uh, confronting mm. one's fall, con confronting one's sin would, would be unbearable. And as a priest, right. I could tell you that if you're hurting there is mercy for you. God wants to run to you mm. with healing and forgiveness. And it begins with mm. just telling the truth. You know, this is what mm. I did. This is how I failed. Yeah. And then we, we commend ourselves to God's mercy. And also, I, I believe from a spiritual point of view, the enemy always wants to convince us that's what's most important about us is our sin. And that what defines us mm. as an individual is whatever sin we're most ashamed of whatever sin we most wow. regret. And as a priest, I have to say, no, that's a lie. What defines us mm. is our baptism. What defines us is our wow. relationship with, with Christ. And uh, through the power of the sacraments and the gospel, our Lord does want to wipe away that stain of sin 
and then bring us not only to mm -hmm. regretting our behavior, but regretting the habits of mind and heart that led to that tragedy. And so real conversion is a reorientation of one's whole life. So I would say to men who are listening, if you've been traumatized by abortion, there is mercy for you, there is hope for you, and there is healing as well. Please check out our, our resources after, after the show today. Go to the website. It is a, a first step towards a pilgrimage of healing that you need to begin today. Friends, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Nathan Masirian, he's Chief Operating Officer of Support After Abortion, getting healing for, for men who've been traumatized by abortion. After the broadcast today, go to the thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. We're on over 100 podcast platforms where you can find audio, you can find us. Download the audio, spread it around, of course. Follow us on your favorite channel, for your favorite platform. Write a five-star review. We need to attract the attention of the algorithms so that these conversations can get the, the attention they deserve. Together, let's break it around the world. We'll be back in just two minutes. Please do stay with us. This is The Catholic Current from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Catch up on an episode you've missed or share them with your family or friends. The Catholic Current is podcasted wherever you enjoy listening. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. My guest today is Nathan Masirian. He's Chief Operating Officer of Support After Abortion, helping to bring healing to men who've been traumatized by abortion. Nathan, before we go forward, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the, the time and the wear of, of your conference. It's an online conference. It's beginning uh, October 16th. Uh, what else do people need to know in order to register for the conference? Yes, if they would visit menhealingfromtrauma.com, there is a large button that says register now. It's for free. And then starting at 9 a.m. this Saturday, October 16th, uh, they will have access to all the online conference speakers. Uh, some are pre-recorded, some are live. One thing that's really unique that we're offering is everyone who joins will have the opportunity to have a live Q&A with each speaker. It's unheard of to be able to ask men who've had abortion more details about their story, challenges that maybe you're facing if you're a man and you're working on uh, your healing journey or you're a leader and want to speak to some of the presenters about what it's like to provide healing for men. All this is available uh, 9 a.m. to 4 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, October 16th. And then after the conference is over, all the presentations will be made available at no charge uh, in perpetuity on the same website. So we want that to be an ongoing resource. That's uh, does not does not have to be a one and done experience. Well, I'm, I'm glad for that. And friends, all this information is going to be available at our, our resources page after the broadcast today. Nathan, suppose somebody comes to you uh, you know, uh, it could be at, at a barbecue uh, or there's a quiet moment. And he mm -hmm. said, hey, Nathan, I hear you, you do this work for guys. And, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm hurting and, you know, I've never talked about this, but uh, I could have been a father. And that was yeah. taken away from me. And I'm, I'm, I'm just living under this big, heavy rock and I can't move forward. How, what do, where do you go from there? How do you begin that conversation? Yeah. You know, thank you for that question. And, and in my mind, I am putting myself uh, in that position right now, sitting uh, at a barbecue uh, off the back of a truck. Sometimes these conversations happen on a golf course when two men are walking, typically uh, between holes. Uh, the very first thing I do say is, I'm so sorry. And to be able to, for a man to hear that, that's a powerful place to start. Yes. I didn't, I didn't question. I don't ask any details. And I wait. 
You know, Father, I want to see how the person reacts. Sometimes the pain comes out as anger, and they may um, be very offended that I would say, I'm sorry, because they haven't even come to grips with what they've experienced. Mm -hmm. Others might already be a place of great tenderness, and so I don't want to miss that moment either. And the person may not feel like talking. And as it is with men in general, we don't think of men as being the the majority of of, uh, people who speak words during the day. So I just like to say I'm sorry. I know that must hurt. And just wait. Then I'll take the cue from them. If somebody wants to go further, this is what I'll say next. Would you be willing to tell me the story about what you experienced? And you'll notice the way I chose those words, I didn't even use the term abortion at that point because it could be a miscarriage law. I also don't know what role he may or may not have had. Again, our our results have shown 44% of the men that we've interviewed said they didn't even know it was happening at that point. So here's a person who maybe has found out after the fact or Or, as I mentioned in our earlier segment, I've talked to men who thought they were doing the right thing by society's norms and paid for the abortion, drove drove over to the clinic and and had the abortion performed. So what's really important is as I'm listening, I'm also not interrupting. Right. And and they themselves are healing, believe it or not, by telling the story. I, I listen to a clinician, and you can certainly tell me your experience too, but there's value in not interrupting somebody because... When they, when they are putting words to their feelings, that is powerful start yes. to having a new voice, no longer listening to the inside voice. So let me, let me give it back to you, Father. What do you see in those kind of moments? Well, when, when I've had, again, you, I, I think you're, you're spot on. Uh, there has to be tremendous compassion. And there is often just a, a wellspring of high-pressured grief and feeling so if they've broached the subject at all that's a tremendous act of trust and i'll acknowledge that thank you for trusting me with this mm-hmm. uh, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm i'm all ears you guide the conversation mm-hmm. you know, where, where do you want to go next uh with that and of course mm-hmm. a, as a priest uh, eventually i'll get around to you know have you brought this to confession there's tremendous healing mm-hmm. we can we can set up a time for for the sacrament and and mm-hmm. and if they've approached me knowing that i'm a priest then then of course that's something mm-hmm. that they're 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 seeking for and i tell them that this is this is the first step in in a long journey and the church can offer both natural and, and supernatural help. And I think that has to be mm. acknowledged as well. Friends, I'm speaking with Nathan Messerian, his chief operating officer of Support After Abortion, bringing healing to men who've been traumatized by abortion. So they've had the first conversation. You know, in my case, they, they, they go to confession. Um, obviously, this isn't something that, that they can deal with alone. It's not one and done. It's not like lancing a, a, a boil. Um, there's yeah. there's oftentimes other stuff associated with it. I mean, it could be in yeah. um, a, a, a marriage or a, a failed relationship or confronting substance abuse. There's usually things right. tangled together. Has that been your experience that that uh, if a man is bringing this wound from abortion with him, there's other stuff along the way that he has to deal with? It is. They're, they're, on the whole, always presenting issues. But here's the twist twist on that. They may be so used to those issues that to them, that is normal. You know, you and I might say jokingly, well, they have road rage. They may really do have road rage and think that's just how you express yourself. Right. Based on, based on how they were raised. And so that process of shining a light on areas for improvement they're not they're not asking me, hey Nathan, tell me where else I need to improve. Not at that right. tender moment. And so right. that's why we'll gently say, maybe you'd like to join a one on one with another man to see if you like to grow as a dad. Maybe the Lord has blessed him with, with children here on earth and so there's right. ways to, to grow that. Maybe there's an opportunity to say more closely to home, you know, are there er- Are there areas in your relationships that you'd like to improve? Again, I'm not judging that. How I asked that question, I didn't say he needs improvement, just inviting you, would you like improvement? And I also didn't suggest it was a wife or children. 
we may find that he, he may disclose that he's an awful boss at work and, mm-hmm. and people can't stand them. And don't know what, what the person's going to say. I have to be so careful that I don't put my expectations on where I think they need to grow, especially in the first relationship. I don't even know the person. Right. So we do want to invite them to, to um, not only have a spiritual guide uh, and through a, a, a priest relationship is essential, but also, you know, what sort of counselor with wisdom can you also uh, also choose to have? And so just inviting that. Um, one of the authors we're going to have at our conference um, for 15 years has has been in Alcoholics Anonymous and as well has gone through something referred to as a children of addicted parents. Mm-hmm. And so there's other programs that may not be necessarily in the church that can also be some steps towards healing and provide sobriety from drugs or alcohol. And I just want to go back to something you said. I, I had a mental health counselor explain to me that we hear about um, sex addiction, but just like you talked about um, Satan's trap of saying you need to soothe or cover over, you know, people who are sex addicted, it's this, I've learned it's very similar. It's uh, it's an attempt to to smother the pain that's bar- right. buried down. It's masked as something else, but typically a man's not thinking that way. He may even think that that's normal, and so going through a counseling process. Uh, I've learned can at least be six months before that mm-hmm. person's even willing to acknowledge there's some need for change. Sorry, that's kind of a long answer. Uh, no, but th- this is this is an important answer that uh, very often our our wounds are tangled together. And I say frequently in preaching yeah. and spiritual direction, if you don't bring mm-hmm. your wounds to our Lord for healing, they're going to get infected with with sin. It's mm-hmm. it's nearly mm-hmm. an inevitability. And sometimes when People kind of bring up dysfunctional behavior without seeing it. I ask them, I don't think that's what healthy, happy people do. You know, mm. uh, you know, road rage, for example, or drinking yourself to a stupor or screaming at your spouse, mm. etc. Uh, that's not what healthy, happy people do. And they say, oh. Mm. And then, you know, I think you also have to engage the imagination and say, what would your life like life to be like? And and that mm, begins to okay. to start a conversation. Now I know in AA, as you get to the later steps, uh, eventually yeah. you become kind of a, a an evangelist for healing, an evangelist for sobriety. And mm-hmm. one of the ways that men can mm-hmm. find healing is to bring healing to others. What does that look like to a man who's been traumatized with abortion? It admits it has done the hard work of healing, yeah. and then he wants to pay it forward. What does that look like? Hmm. So some of those men will be at our conference, uh, not to do a shameless plug, but that's part Go of the way it. that is restoring their healing is to say uh, their their words will be like this. I'm an open book. I have walked the hard path and use my broken roadmap as a path for your own healing. Because men who are trapped and they're isolated they don't even know what the, what a path could look like, right? It's this idea of you're in a room with no windows and then there's no light. You are, you really feel stuck. So the men who are giving back want to say, brother, here's a way forward. Or leader, here's how you can walk men forward. So that seems to be really meaningful. I've also seen um, men um, decide to be what we call a peer counselor. So support after abortion has a an anonymous uh, phone service, uh, both for men and women, and if a man uh, calls, he'll be paired with an anonymous um, uh, healing counselor who is a man just like him, who has walked through abortion just like him. And so he's met, as you said earlier, with compassion, with understanding, with listening, and real-life experience. Um, there's something about someone who's experienced that same pain to say, brother, I do know what you're walking through. Um, and so that's another way um, men who are on the healing path can give back. Right. Right. I, I I'll think... just add one, a third one. Go ahead. Uh, just a quick third one is uh, teaching the next generation. And so several of the men have been saying to me, uh, um, Nathan, how do we educate the young men of today's culture of what authentic biblical manlyhood looks like? Yes. So 
just want to say that as a third piece. Uh, no, I'm, I'm very glad for that. There, you know, ultimately, we, we want preventive medicine. Uh, you, yes, mm-hmm. you know, changes in laws, et cetera, et cetera, all those things. Mm-hmm. But event, a, a culture of life, you, you wouldn't even have to have regulation of, of, of abortion. So yeah. uh, to, to be a, an authentic man, to be oriented towards family life, to be pro-life, to, uh, to form young men who want to distinguish themselves in the service of Christ the King, that's the culture that I want to live in, and that's the culture that I want to contribute to. Friends, we come back. We're going to continue our conversation with Nathan Masirian, he's Chief Operating Officer of Support After Abortion, a work that brings healing to men who've been traumatized by abortion. In the next segment, we're going to talk about the, the role that, that women can, can play. After the broadcast today, go to the thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as possible, Podcast. Be part of the conversation. Follow what we're following by following us on Gab. That's G A B dot com. Our channel is The Catholic Current. Everything you need to take this conversation to your family and friends, we give to you. Together, let's take it around the world. We can do it together. We cannot do it without you. Let's get busy starting today. Friends, we'll be back in just two minutes. Please do stay with us. next National Men's March to End Abortion is Monday, November 15th in Baltimore. We will gather outside of a local abortion center and march to our rally point outside of the USCCB Fall Assembly. Men, it's time. We are killing unborn children by the millions. Yet how many men should be here? But where have all the good men gone? Where are you? Go to themensmarch.com for more information and commit to join us on November 15th in Baltimore. After today's broadcast, go to the Catholic Current Show page on thestationofthecross.com for info on today's guests, the show resource links, and to sign up for our weekly email of upcoming shows. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. My guest today is Nathan Masirian. He's Chief Operating Officer of Support After Abortion. We're talking about getting healing for men who have been traumatized by abortion. And do register for their conference. Go for go to uh, menhealingfromtrauma.com. It's an online conference this Saturday. It's very important. Nathan, going through your, your websites, I noticed that you had a site there called Saving the Storks. Uh, and we're going to link to that. Mm-hmm. Well, tell us a little bit about that, please. So Save the Storks is a wonderful organization we've, we've partnered with or um, so grateful. We're so grateful to them. They're one of the sponsors for this conference. Um, what they provide is uh, a strategy to help uh, crisis pregnancy centers around the United States learn how to raise funds for mobile medical clinics. Um, I've seen pregnancy centers use these in two ways. One is for those that have um, large college campuses, they will take these um, very brightly decorated Um, mobile medical clinics and take them to universities or football games. And for free, they can offer a pregnancy test. Sometimes they'll offer a test for um, sexually transmitted diseases. And some even provide, the really powerful is an ultrasound to see, uh, to see the baby. And so Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a way that you don't have to just expect a a client in that case, a unexpected pregnant mom to drive to a location. You can, you can find this, uh, these buses in different cities around the country, and this organization, this nonprofit, is dedicated to providing um, access to um, choice and education, but from a, um, a pro-life perspective. And so they they teach clinics how to both use the equipment to fundraise for it. Averages about a hundred thousand uh, dollars to have a mobile unit. I'm, I'm based today in Florida, and our local pregnancy center has two of these uh, mobile medical units, and they uh, primarily take them to the large state colleges, and they're parked out front, and people can come and go as they please, bringing the pregnancy center message uh, to where the 
where the necess needed population is. Also. That that is tremendously important, Nathan. What what is the role of of women in in healing? I think one of the reasons why we're living in this pro-abortion culture is we've fractured right relationship between men and women. In your experience, do women have a particular role to play in the healing of men who've been traumatized by abortion? Oh boy, they have a huge role. I'm going to end with what I think is the most powerful story I've heard about women involved in healing, but on the on the um, the more easier to access piece. Um, I find many, many women are already leading healing messages, primarily focused on, on healing, healing for women. And so they've designed programs and styles that are very women friendly. Uh, that means uh, the kind of font that you use, the, the color paint, the decorations on the wall. And if a man uh, walks to that experience, comes in and is presented in an environment that does not feel like jokingly, a man cave, Right. we implicitly are saying to a man, you don't really belong here, this is for women, and we unwittingly reinforce the message that men don't hurt. So women have a, have a role in setting the context to say, yes, it is acceptable for men to be hurting, men to be hurting very deeply, to be um, wanting a chance to change, and so their physical environments, the programs they offer, we believe should also be equally for men and available for women. That's a key role. Two, for leaders, come to our conference and our and sportafterabortion.com to learn how to provide healing programs because we've learned men heal differently than women. The way they access their left and right side of the brain, the way God's created us, is different between a man and a woman. And so our programs are designed to help guide leaders, counselors, to know how to speak to a man and it is different than how you speak to a woman for counseling. And then let me just end with this um, relationship role. Mm -hmm. Let's say it is a husband and wife relationship or, or relationship, a, a long lasting relationship between a man and a woman um, in which there is a, a abortion or trauma in their past. What I've, what I've um, listened to is in a joint counseling session, the man shares his past trauma. Things I've learned about fathers, one in seven men have been sexually abused before 18. Mm -hmm. One in four have experienced physical abuse. And then later, they are um, in a place to have made an abortion decision. And so for a woman to hear a man say, and, and through tears, just put yourself in that moment, mm -hmm. and through tears, this is the trauma I've experienced before I was 12 years old, before I was 15. And then, you know, kind of the classic story they get pregnant at 18, 19, or 20. We had an abortion. And then my life has been a wreck since then. And they described that wreck. For the woman to be able to say, I'm so sorry, and to feel the weight of that trauma, to realize that that man has been severely hurt, even before the abortion um, experience, creates a real sense of understanding, not mm -hmm. making him feel like, He's the perpetrator, and it creates freedom to start healing, to start helping him accept the decisions he has made. But for her to be able to graciously extend God's grace and understand the fuller picture is an amazing, invaluable role. But that's done in a counseling session. I'm not recommending that happens casually or right. going to right. the no, that's, that's... For, for, for dinner. Right, right. You know, I, I, I tell people, I said, there, there are things that I'm trained to do. There are things that I'm ordained to do, and then there are things that are mm. just beyond my ability. And often, the healing of those wounds of such depth, there, it requires a team approach. So there's a place mm. for ministry. There's a place for counseling. There's a place for group support and, and community and, and and so on. And certain types of conversations need to be guided by someone who's got the skills and, and, and the training. Yeah. Just as I, I wouldn't volunteer to, uh, you know, clean your teeth or perform surgery on you or, or set a broken bone, there, there are certain types of conversations that really require uh, very skilled care. And, and I think that having that conversation can can lead to reconciliation for for both the 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 man and the woman to say they both suffered they suffered you uniquely uh and sometimes the woman mm -hmm. who's involved wasn't the wasn't the woman who who was pregnant it, it could be That's a true. sister it could be 
it could be a friend uh but to have i i think that that men who are in pain are drowning in toxic shame and they need yeah. to hear from both a man and a woman that your your pain doesn't define you and the shame mm. beyond a certain point begins to tell mm. a lie uh, nathan we got about mm. 35 seconds left give us the information again for for your conference the when and the where I'd be glad to. So menhealingfromtrauma.com. It's a free online conference, October 16th, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Those who register for free will have unlimited access to all the recordings. We want that to be an ongoing tool for men and for leaders to provide healing for those impacted by abortion. And friends, if you're thinking of someone who might be moved by today's episode, someone who might benefit from it, but is not uh, a regular listener to The Catholic Current, please make every effort to get this conversation to them. Grab our audio on your mm. favorite podcast platform, get it at the thestationofthecross.com and say, I think this could be good for you. Maybe we should listen to it together. Uh, Nathan M M Masirian of Support After Abortion, God bless your good work. I hope we can have another conversation soon. I look forward to it. Thank you, Father. I'm Jesuit Father Robert McCaig, your host here every day at the Catholic Current. Join us tomorrow. We're going to meet up with Victoria Taff of PJ Media. We're going to be talking about updates on vaccine mandates, who's pushing back and why. After the broadcast today, go to thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Take this conversation to your family and friends. Together, we'll take it around the world. Through the intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, may my mighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross .com, a listener funded nonprofit organization. Please prayerfully consider donating at the Station of the Cross .com by calling 1 877 888 6279 or through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app.